can't make a presentation. We've got Alti Holcomb from Senator Ross' office uh, is here. I'm back here observing. Back here observing. Well, we might make you say hello. 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 <laughs> so, um, uh, our main agenda tonight is the Senate Bill 994. Uh, as it relates to the March JPA in the county, the March JPA will sunset in July of 2025 and primary control be relinqu relinquished to the county. And that's what the bill uh, is addressing. So that bill kind of came up quickly. And so we asked for someone to come and kind of talk about it and explain uh, with it to us. And um, Jeff has been kind enough to come at short notice and, and kind of uh, go over it with us. So I'm going to put up. His presentation let him start in and talk about um, what he's going to discuss with us. So, I have one quick question. Could you explain how bills start in California? Anyone, any assembly person can request or pro propose a bill, right? Unlike our federal people who can't do anything. That sounds like a loaded question. Okay, uh, I'm trying to understand this. So yeah. I understand where people So my, uh, my original experience on bills comes from conjunction junction and uh, how a bill becomes a law. Uh, but the short answer to your question is yes. Uh, folks can introduce a bill in either the state assembly or the state senate. Uh, then it goes through uh, a lot of work goes into actually drafting the language and then sending it to the appropriate committee for review and reports. It spends time with the lawyers looking at it and then it works its way through whatever house it initiated in. And then if it can clear that house, it goes to the other house and then it works its way through again. And ultimately, uh, if the bill does get passed by both houses, it heads up to the governor's office and then he can either veto it or sign it. So when you say it clears the house that originated, again, anybody can put one to the floor, right? Anyone can put one voting, so to speak. Right. So what you do is you write the, you know, any member can draft a law. It then goes to the appropriate committees. First, it has to pass out of the committee, and some bills require are required to go to multiple committees. Depending on the nature. Depending on the nature, how many things it involves, if there's costs associated with it, that sort of thing. And then once it gets out of committee, then it goes to the floor of the house where it originated. And or a thumbs up or thumbs down. Both. Right. Right. And, and there, there is some discussion on, on the floor if you want to, and so on and so forth. There is discussion, certainly at committee hearings, and then there's discussion on the floor. And then there is, as evidenced by what we're going to talk about tonight, there's discussion off the floor, right, with legislators who authored the bill, legislators who may or may not support the bill. So there's lots of uh, both on the floor and in open session, but also community group meetings and meetings with different folks trying to figure out what the right decision is on each bill. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, and I am not going to look over my left shoulder to Alti, who is here from Senator Ross' office, to make sure I got that right. Yes, you did. Okay. This uh, <laughs> the only time I'm going to talk. So just kind of add sub supplement what Jeff just said. Uh, constituents can also go to their local, uh, their representative state assembly member or state senator and fill out what we in our office call a constituent bill proposal. And what that does is we would typically request it, give it to a particular constituent who's interested in a certain area. They fill it out, send it back to us. We send it up to our capital, our Sacramento office for vetting. And then at that point, our chief of staff will then hand it to the senator for consideration. So that's another avenue in which a bill can be proposed. How, how often does that happen? And what Very rarely. Okay. Very rarely. It doesn't mean we can't do it. That's true. Okay. Well, and similarly, uh, members of the public, but also interested parties. Um, that's how SB 994 actually came to be, is that we recognized there was a need to take action. And so we actually went up to Sacramento to make that pitch. And when Alti says he's not going to speak, he is uh, here to hear the feedback. He's here to be to hear the questions that you all have after my presentation and to take that feedback back to Senator Ross. So he's not making a presentation, not asking questions or answering questions, but really wanted to hear from the community so he could report back to the senators. Similarly, we have an individual named Tom Ketchum who is with us today, also in the back. Tom is uh, filling a similar role for Supervisor Jeffries' office. Uh, Supervisor Jeffries is uh, 
Is he the supervisor in this area? Yes and no, right? Yes. It's um, but he is certainly uh, currently on the March JPA, uh, and he's also wears another hat out as a member of the Board of Supervisors. So he wanted to make sure that he had somebody here also to hear the feedback. Then the other two folks hanging out in the back, uh, Juan Perez is the Chief Operating Officer of the county, and Tina Grandy is a policy analyst in our office. And our uh, couple of folks who are inside the office working on this bill. So what I want to talk about today, and we go to the next slide, is uh, really a brief history, uh, and so that we have context and background for this discussion. Uh, talk about what the current challenge is, uh, how we propose to address that challenge, which is Senate Bill 994. I want to talk about what that bill does. I want to talk about what that bill doesn't do. And then I want to make sure there's an opportunity for questions, uh, certainly on this topic. Um, but if you have others related to it, uh, certainly I can uh, ensure to talk about that as well. Next slide. Whenever I do a presentation, I was talking here to the chair who's got sort of that teacher mentality. I always sort of start at the end. Uh, why did we go to the Senate to ask for uh, a legislative fix? Really, it's simple. We wanted to provide certainty to the community and to the folks who have been engaged in working with the March JPA since 1997. We wanted to avoid confusion and we wanted to ensure continuity. So those were really the three goals and that's our purpose in getting SB 994. So you'll see this slide again at the end and hopefully, you know, as you're listening to what I'm saying, you understand our goals when we did that. And this is our best uh, attempt to try and get and meet that mark. Next slide. This group knows all too well, just for the sake of it, um, I know you can be on this group living anywhere. How many folks actually live in the Mission Grove neighborhood areas? How many folks have lived there for more than 10 years? How many folks have lived there more than 20 years? How many folks have lived there more than 30 years, right? And so uh, it's change has happened, right? We've seen it happen all the way around us. Uh, I was eavesdropping on a conversation earlier at the table Riverside County is the size of New Jersey. Riverside County is 7,300 square miles. Um, and we continue to grow and we have, and folks are coming here for lots of uh, good things that's happening here, but then there's also impacts to that. Part of the change that you all have seen in this area is the transition from the March Air Base to the March Air Reserve Base. When that footprint for the base shrunk, there was then surplus land and surplus buildings that they had to figure out what to do with. So in 1993, the decision was made by the four cities in the county, the four cities being Reno Valley, Paris, uh, City of Riverside, and then the County of Riverside, to create a joint powers authority that would be able to work together to apply, apply a regional approach in planning and land use decisions for the property that was given up or the surplus facilities that were given up by the March Air Base. Uh, land use authority, the decisions about how to use the land, how to obligate the land, how to condition the land, were delegated from those entities or from the government to uh, the March JPA in 1997. So what has March JPA been up to since 1997? As we can look around, right? They've been up to a lot. So in that, uh, <laughs> I was going to do the math on that, and I would get in trouble with my wife. I got married in 1997. I'll have right off the top of my head how many years that is. Uh, if she was here, I'd say, it feels just like yesterday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so since 1997, what have they been up to? Right? There have been a number of disposition and developer agreements. There's been a number of statutory development agreements. We've had settlement agreements, uh, negotiated settlement agreements, and court settlement agreements. Special tax districts have been set up, and a number of ordinances and resolutions have been adopted. So that's the context of where we are. Next slide. So what is the current challenge? What is the problem we're trying to solve? The March JPA is going to be evolving next year. The decision was made by the member agencies to change the focus of the March JPA. Uh, and to return land use authority, that decision-making authority from the March JPA to the County of Riverside. And with that delegation or return of the land use authority to the county comes with obligations that also go with the county or go to the county. And all of that is effective July 1st, 2025. Is that, I'm sorry, 
Now, how is that piece of land? Is it broken up into by city? Get this piece and city and county is all going. Everything's counted. All land use goes to the county. It's all right now at this point. All um, part of the going to be the unincorporated area. And uh, when we say that the decision was made by the JPA and the member agencies, any of the folks who have uh, attended those JPA meetings or attended city meetings, this was um, a long process. It was um, a negotiated process to try and figure out exactly that. So part of the agreement that the JPA or the decision the JPA made and the member agencies agreed to was uh, keep that land unincorporated for a number of years, cities could not incorporate in other pieces of it or peel other pieces off. And with that decision came the decision to uh, share the revenue that came from that area between the different agencies and entities. So that land comes to uh, Riverside County for land use authority. Will it ever be divided by into the cities or is that something down the road also? That's something down the road. It will not be um, developed by the cities or, or given to the cities for X number of years. I don't know the number of years off the top of my head. 2041. Yeah. So, so down the road. So, and by the way, we can can't say never on it, right? But um, the reality is that was contemplated by the JPA. And part of the reason why we're in the challenge that we have is um, we want to try and predict all potential eventualities. We want to try and be ready for whatever comes next. And so one of the challenges that we have with the decision that's made is land use authority comes to the county in 2025, July 1, 2025. But what about all the decisions that were made before that? What about all of the agreements that were entered into that? What about all the ordinances and the sections that were adopted before that? How do those transfer to the county July 1 of 2025? So what do we do? And I'm a uh, recovering lawyer. So I, you know, what we do is we look to the law. Is there already some sort of legal authority that allows the county to stay, you know, to that transfer to happen? And the answer is no. Uh, in a lot of other settings, for example, if a city disincorporates, that would go to an organization called LAPCO. There is nothing like that in the law for a JPA that is taking or evolving in this fashion. So we have this uncertainty as a result of the decision to return land use. So what happens when we have uncertainty? Does every agreement then get reopened? Is every agreement renegotiated? Is every code section have to be readopted? That causes uh, a lot of confusion. It causes a lot of consternation and it causes, you know, in the, in the legal world, settled law to become unsettled and that is full of nothing but problems and challenges. So there was not a similar situation for us to compare it to. So when we sat around with some of the best minds that we have looking at this, we said, what can we do? We can actually go to Sacramento. We can actually suggest a law that would be specific only to Riverside County and specific only to this situation that says, and if you want the next slide. So are other base closures, other, it's a state requirement to have that some type of law passed. What about what about other closures that have been federal law? So here's the thing that this well, is Long Beach, for example, many years ago. So this is a unique situation to us. We had the air base shrink to the air reserve base, and then the decision was made to create the JPA, and now the JPA is evolving into a different role. So that is a unique situation. And we have looked for analogous situations, we haven't been able to find it which is why we have to say, you know, can we get this law that allows for, back to my original slide, continuity, avoid so continuity. It was the JPA in the middle of that that sort of was different from other base closures. Well, I don't know the specifics of other base closures and maybe the JPAs haven't gone away. If there was a JPA. Well, I could say maybe they were not, that's what yeah. I'm saying. I'm just telling you, there's no law that govern the situation. That's California the law. Correct. And that's the law we have to certainly operate under. So what does SB 994 do? It transfers previous JPA decisions and actions to the county. It transfers those contractual rights and obligations and settlement agreements. And it transfers every decision and action that the uh, JPA takes before that transfer date of July 1, 2025. What else does it do? It ensures that continued maintenance of the infrastructure. So part of what the JPA did over the last uh, 27 years is uh, create landscape maintenance districts. They created community facilities districts. 
And so now the county takes that over as part of SB 994 to can make sure that we continue to provide those services in the area. And then it keeps the regulatory ordinances and resolutions in place. That's approximately 80 ordinances and approximately 640 resolutions. Yeah, both. Uh, could you say that out loud? <laughs> Holy moly. Holy moly, right? <laughs> Holy moly is right. That's sort of what we're feeling because if there is not a clean mechanism that transfers this to the county, what does that mean? Does that mean we need 640 separate actions on each resolution and 80 separate ordinances? Do we need to go back to court on settlement agreements? Do we need to go back to court on developer agreements or environmental justice agreements? Holy moly is why we're doing SB 994. Um, so thanks for the assist. So you're not going to be able to go back and renegotiate or redo stuff or claim that well they did that back then and we're here now you know it's um either you cheated by looking at what the next slide is or it's a brilliant question so let's go to the next slide <laughs> sb 994 what doesn't it do it does not reverse decisions made by the jpa so to answer your question no. any decision they've made by june 30 of 2025 comes to the county fully baked blocked we don't go back and re relitigate that decision it does not undo any negotiated settlement agreements it does not weaken existing contracts also sb 994 does not weigh in on any issues currently before the jpa and it does not pick any favorites between our various constituent groups so i got a, a squirrel look over there so tell me why you think it picks favorites uh if have you talked to the community yet <laughs> well, that's why we're, you, you is, haven't talked with the community yet. So you, your opinion is that it doesn't pick favors, but so we'll, we'll get to that later. So, so it, 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 um, yeah. Step one, we're here, right? Right. Step two is additional discussions, but the reality is, um, based upon the and go back to the, uh, the next slide. Our goals again are to provide certainty, avoid confusion, and ensure continuity. And based upon uh, the way that the law was intended and the way that we believe the law is written. It does not weaken agreements. It does not open up closed agreements. It does not do anything other than take decisions that are fully baked by the March JPA and transfer the responsibility of enforcing those to the county leadership. Well, one of the big fears is they'll make a whole bunch of decisions before it transfers. That yes. can't be like check. Me, John. I'm giving them a blank check. Yeah. And so that is, um, well, you does anybody do that we can certainly to do whatever they want it, you take it no matter what it was well i guess and so but the nice thing we have is we have the ability for folks to go before the march jpa and share their views we have you know, well, i'm just saying that's, anyone from the march jpa here what's that is there anyone from the march jpa here? look this is not enough this is us saying why we're asking 994. there's an opportunity to march jpa meets and you can absolutely share your thoughts with them like so I've been trying to talk to Mark Jay for two years. They are the most unresponsive, unaccountable organization I've ever dealt with. Yes. So <laughs> I hear what you're saying, but our skepticism towards this bill is that you're providing a blank check to an organization that has not uh, has refused to have a community advisory board, refused to engage with the community in any any meaningful way uh, regarding the projects that they are currently. Uh, trying to do, they're trying to do a 25 year development agreement right before they run out from the sunset for 4.7 million square feet of warehouses next to our homes. And with, so, with somebody who already they had a 25 year that's correct, which is something you couldn't do at the county. So, we have significant issues with handing them a blank check and say, Yes, we trust them. We, we come from a position of skepticism towards the agency that has uh, built the project today, and they haven't met their uh, public. Uh, they haven't provided the public facilities that they promised to meet. The settlement agreements are still out there, and they're 21 years old to provide us a 60 acre park. They haven't provided a single red penny in fees to make that park happen. So, do we think that that should just be transferred off to the county and let it sit for another 20 years? Yeah. So, I think part of the question is what is the best opportunity to get that park built? Uh, they have the money right now, they could build it today. So, I think part of the issue is. Um, Ultimately, if we're talking, you can go to the next one, which is just the discussion slide. I think. Um, the reality is, first, go back to the ability to reach the JPA. I certainly don't represent the JPA. I know that the, the, the membership of that group are elected officials from each of those cities, mm -hmm. right? And I know certainly Supervisor Jeffries and Supervisor Gutierrez are responsive to the community. 
Uh, I mean, that's that's my experience, and in other areas, and certainly we can have a discussion offline about that. Um, I've worked with uh, each of the council members for the city of Riverside, the city of Reno Valley, and the city of Paris, and my experience is that they're also responsible. So I think that that is the opposite. What I think is not the issue is saying that SB 994 is bad because the JPA is doing something. The reality is without SB 994, everything is uncertain. Everything potentially is reopened. And I will tell you from a good governance, from a good community, from a good uh, public benefit, opening all those up to uncertainty and question marks is a very serious challenge. And so you then, you said you're not favoring any constituents, but you are favoring the people who have established conflict and, and disenfranchising the community members who have not been listened to last. 15 years. And so when you say that all constituents are treated equally, that is coming from the place of positions of people who already have uh, established interests in the JPA and not people who have been kept out of the process. And I think um, what my point was is that SB 994 does not pick favorites among, amongst the constituency. What SB 994 does is take settled decisions, whether that be by the JPA, whether that be by a court, whether that be a negotiated settlement. And those settlement agreements exist and continue and have to then be enforced by the county. What we don't want to have happen, and no one wants to see this happen, unless you have a particular worldview, is to view the transfer of land use authority from the March JPA to the county as an opportunity to lift the lid on every agreement and somehow renegotiate, relitigate, or refight it. And that is just, that's bad public policy. Well, can the legislation be amended to where it would require them? To complete certain agreements that you know have been sitting around for 20 years, like the park, forward with those and get the action going before the July 25th. I mean, that's certainly something that we can take back to the senator. The reality is, um, you can try and figure out, but it's just this is a you've all read the law, I imagine, right? You, oh, it's a big question is, is it that draft form? Where is it? We have it yeah, so there's actually a link. Uh, oh, yeah. on the slides it is public um, and just by you know so you have sort of what the process is it is currently with um, the committee that would be reviewing it there's an opportunity to provide public comment and feedback to the committee there's an opportunity to provide public comment certainly to the author but also to any other of our state delegation uh, and the, either in the senate or the assembly so you have the opportunity to give that feedback what about um, you handcuff these guys and say only going to your authority in July 20, 2025, you only have the authority to contract through that you can't put in 25 year agreements in. You can't put stuff that's going to screw the people that live up here. Um, and you know, on June 15th, and say, Oh, we have your agreement for five million square feet of warehouse. So, you guys all like all that truck traffic. Some of our so if they can't be getting longer than that, then that, that protects the county from saying and saying, you know, we don't have to live with something you did that was bad on the last day. Well, and I will tell you that um, everybody has an interest in the March JPA making is all. And so uh, the process that occurs is for uh for folks to provide feedback to the Marsh JPA on any item that's going before them. I will tell you the County of Riverside provides feedback to uh, the Marsh JPA. Are you guys time. required to comment to those questions? Are we required to? No. But we want to make sure that we have, you know, ultimately, for example, the park. If under SB 994 this comes to us, we want to make sure that there's funding available to build the park. And the reality is that's part of why we talked about all those agreements. There are obligations that exist past July 1st. I didn't say anything past it, but they can't there anything new that goes past that because then you're going to get the June 15th, 25 year deal. And all of a sudden we've got another 25,000 trucks driving up and down the here on the June 15th. I mean, you may not live up here. I do. But we do. So we were given to Alessandro about 7 30 in the morning. Not on purpose. Don't drive. <laughs> right? Look, I get it. I mean, I will tell you um, to get here, I make sure I don't come up Chicago. 
right? Or central before Chicago, right? I come the back way by UCR. So I get it. We understand it. But ultimately, so that's, you know, I want to hear the feedback. The feedback is not the bill itself. The feedback, if I'm getting, if I'm capturing it correctly, yes. it is not our intent for to solve the problems we want to solve, right? You all support that effort. The bill is not uh, bad and evil in of itself. What your concern is, is your concern that the March JPA would act inappropriately. Yeah, so... I mean, so that's why it's just yeah. like, yeah. well, it's not, it's not a loophole. Well, so what you're actually saying is that it, I, I would not say it's a loophole. It says once it gets transferred, it comes to us. What you're asking is, what, what you're, well, it's not a feature. Uh, it's not a feature. It's a fact of the legislation. So what you're saying, just so I'm clear, is you want a, you want the bill to be amended to say that uh the march jpa can't make any decisions after x date no or no they can't yeah. agree they're in an agreement that extends it they cannot enter into an agreement that extends past june 30th 2025 is what you're saying is they can't take any land use decisions between now and july yes yeah, any yeah. new one that, yes. that is obviously a march jpa issue that's not a state law issue we're getting related to the transfer you can put it in the bill right What's that? You're taking this comment, put it in the bill. Yeah, no, so that's why this is why we're having what a discussion. But I just want to be clear that the issue is not with the bill or the purpose of the bill. No. Your issue is the lack of trust for the March JPA. Yeah. Right. Correct. Right. Okay. Right. So, so the money you've got a 25 year track record of. <laughs> yeah. You got such a good track record. Exactly. <laughs> so, my question is you got 640 and you have 80, of which we don't know what any of that is, whether that's for or against us. Why is it necessarily a bad thing to have those things open up and be litigated if you could annihilate a percentage of that that becomes better for the community and maybe it's less draw on the tax base of the people that live up here? So why is it like, I mean, we have so many bills and laws that they constantly make, but they don't enforce the ones we already have. So why not just let it go and let us as a community vote on all of it and then once it becomes Part of Riverside County, we get to make the decisions, assuming we get to make any decisions um, with our voting processes. Then let's that look at that. <laughs> the reality is having finality, having certainty in settled agreements, settled law is good public policy. If we just say that every decision made by the JPA is now, because we don't have SB 994, that's back to where the confusion lies. Right? And so then does everything become renegotiated? I will use a different argument. Does that mean that the agreement that was settled to get the park in the upper plateau is now undone? That's a question that I think, especially if for two years we have organizations in the community that have been trying to reach out, but haven't been able to get any type of response back. Now, I understand that when you're in a certain position and you have full the job, well, you're you're going to be looked at a little differently than uh, you know house number X Y Z, you know, in constituent who lives on ABC Lane versus somebody who holds a title and his recovered lawyer, and, you know, etc. You have more experience, therefore they're going to look at you differently than they're going to look at us as a homeowner, you know. And I mean, we're a tax base but, and we're a vote. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we get what we want for our community because other people who are elected may or may not have lived in the community for 30 years, 20 years, five years. They're making decisions that isn't necessarily something that the community is in agreement with. And it's happened for decades. What happens to the money? Like they've got money sitting aside for the park. So when it rolls over, what happens to them? Those are part of the discussions that we're having with them. Those are part of our comments specifically about uh, some of the plans is to make sure that there is money to, in essence, effectuate this, uh, this transfer and the obligations. What is the, um, the view of the opinion of the, of the local people, the residents, particularly if there's a known issue that is considered egregious and would persist and probably worsen over time? What is the incentive for them to resolve those now and bring remedies so that 
it can be launched in a more peaceful way. I mean, you can say theoretically, theoretically you're here for that purpose, but probably you're more here for for the senator to, I mean, for the um, senator. senator. To, to make sure that the bill, you know, is, is uh, acceptable and solid. Right. So what I'm here, just so we're clear, is I'm not here for Senator Roth, um, not here for the Marsh JPA. I'm here for the County of Riverside to explain the challenge we saw, the solution that we identified, and what we think 994 does and what it doesn't do. So that's what I'm here for, is just to uh, make sure that you heard it from the county, that you heard what our purpose was, uh, and ultimately the problem that we're trying to solve and identify the solution. In terms of what's the role of the constituent in making their voice heard, um, that is one that I feel the frustration, obviously, about the inability to have those comments, the meaningful ability to make those comments in the past. I would just say that I would continue to reach out to the specific electeds. Um, it's here in the city, it's uh, Council Member Condor and Council Member Perry. We've got, um, two more council members in Marina Valley and two more in Paris. And my experience even before I got this job was that those folks have been responsive and want to hear from you. Yeah. So specifically to section 83, uh, I would like to request to the senators uh, left of it that instead of what it says right now, which is the authority may assign contractual obligations that are set forth in the written agreements, that are not limited to settlement and development agreements. It mirrors the language in section 65865.3 of the California Code, which is about the annexation of land into cities. And it says that when prior development agreements are in place, the development agreement shall be the shorter of the development agreement length for eight years as the incorporation date. And so they should mirror that language and be, I would say, three years because we have this issue where we don't trust the agencies. So we don't want a 25 years development agreement. We want short development agreements that will quickly transfer over to the county so that the county can, can review and have control of and isn't entering into a long-term uh, contract. So I think that's well established in state law for other processes. It should be reflected in this one as well. Can you give me the number? I have 658.63. It's 658.63. Okay, it's 658. agreement entered into prior to incorporation or annexation. Six here it is right here. Yeah. Six, five, point three. Thank you for that. I so I, I also wanted to just say I'm sorry if it seems like we're upset. We're not upset you. Oh. Thank you for coming. And for, it, it helps to know where this comes from and what what but I think what you're hearing is that the community has a lack of trust in the JPA, and our concern is that as it is written, um, there's no guardrails at all. They can do something on the last day, screw the community for 15 years, and just be like, well, that's what it, it's law. It's law. They have to do it now. Um, and we just want to have some guardrails like, if you are sunsetting, why are you entering into 20 years? Exactly. But it would be helpful for you to go back to your people. And, and, and I actually and I think forced that we should grow. <laughs> I don't want to ruin a surprise. This that. isn't a torching. <laughs> this is the community it's discussion. A different relationship with the day, day. I understand that. But I also think it's in the county's interest to put guardrails in because you don't want to be left holding the bag when you don't have any control over the decision. I understand there's things that are already in place. You don't want to break contracts that are already there. But, like, as you see, there's there's already community concern, and then now the county's going to inherit that. Um, same with the settlement agreements that have been there for 20 years. Like, I don't understand why if they have why if they're if they have 16 months left, why is it their effort about fulfilling their existing obligations to the community that they haven't fulfilled instead of entering into new development agreements that are going to last decades? So if, if we can amend the law to just have a few guardrails, that would really help. Um, well, and I appreciate that feedback, and I, I really appreciate um, constructive suggestions on how to amend it. Are there other sections of the bill that you have? I don't want to read your notes. And say, you know, no, no. But 
Well, I, I, actually, I mean, does the county have to accept everything the JPA does? If this, of course, this we would accept. Yeah. Yeah. They're, 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 so they, they're, they're going to step, step into the place of the JPA. So that's exactly right. We just, step into the shoes. Just, just, just as, a, just as a, there's nobody on the out there on the system, the JPA decided to make a nuclear waste dump. The county would have to accept it. So what we would do is what um, we are doing already is we are actively engaged in public comment, actively engaged in responding during the comment period. You would see us at the meetings and um, engaging in all sorts of lobbying activities to make sure that a nuclear waste site does not get uh, put into Mission Group. Well, I think one of the problems is the March APA is function like a city or a county making decisions that they would make for planning and stuff, but didn't have that link and responsibility back to the public because it was split up into four pieces. And most people didn't even know they had city council sitting on it. They didn't even know that it really existed. They heard about it. There's this thing called a March JPA, but really what it is. So they've been kind of in that no man's land where they weren't really an official city, where they had all those obligations and responsibilities, but they weren't really this. And there was four different groups. So they've been allowed to do things that I guess a normal city and putting out notices, you know, wouldn't necessarily be able to get away with if they had a strong con constituency that was challenging them. So that's one of the fears now is that now that like recently they came out and they've been having these meetings on that environmental, put your sticker on 75 things that you think you want to do. We're going like, what are you doing that for? You're not going to do anything with this by the time July 2025 comes on. It's just ingenuine, you know. It's just, and that's kind of what's happened with them. And, and it's gone along. They they put in all the warehouses and put all the stuff in, and they talked about the trucks and the semi trucks were brought up. But then there was no nothing about changing the freeway coming up the hill to account for the trucks. In fact, the report was, oh, there's no intentions of changing that and putting, you know, additional truck lanes to allow for the trucks with, for the added traffic. So on one hand, they were anxious to get the properties developed, but on the other hand. They really kind of ignored a lot of the consequences that were going to come afterwards that now the community is having to live with. Um, Typical. They just, you know, I don't live there. Who cares? Yeah. Well, and I think they were thinking about their own little pieces of the pie down the road, too. Like, you know, this city is going to get this when it's all over, and this city is going to get that. So we're kind of rubbing each other in order to make sure we get those pieces that we're going to get. So there was a, a bit of a, uh, lack of impartiality in the fact that they were you know they had skin in the game you know, at the end of the day which like you said was kind of unusual for the setup it's kind of not been done before so one of my questions would be so they didn't think of how they were going to close this out back when they developed it 20 years ago as to how it was going to sunset I wasn't there yeah right and so i mean the reality is we are um we can certainly go back and try and, you know, um, gosh, I wish they would have done certain things back in 93 or 97. The reality is we are here today and we are 16 months, 14 months out from when this thing happens. We need to make sure that there is uh, a mechanism for a uh, appropriate transfer of authority and obligations. If I'm not mistaken, when, if this bill passes, will the JPA be obligated to follow this if it passes. If 994 passes? Yeah. Uh, yeah, state law. Okay, if it becomes state law. Oh, look, if, if it, it passes, signed by the governor, if right. the bill becomes a law, yeah. So between now and then, I'm, I'm hearing what everybody's saying and I'm hearing what you're saying. But what I'm not getting is what is, what would it take for you to actually put language in there that says specifically they cannot enter into any agreements that obligates anyone past the date of the transfer. So I, I don't think, um, at least I'm unaware of any legislation that tells a JPA that they cannot make decisions. No, I'm asking you now, what is keeping us or keeping you or keeping whoever is writing and controlling this bill, what is there that's keeping them from putting that language in there? Is there a legal reason why someone would not be able to put that language in there? 
That's a great question for the uh, council for the legislature, and that's something that we could take a look at. But I will tell you um, what was suggested today as an alternative from existing law is, is a better approach for the, someone to consider. So there, I doubt there's going to be just a, the precedent setting of the legislature telling an independent JPA you can't make decisions because of this, that, and the other. I mean, these are for what it's worth the types of fights that we have around. Um, telling a school board what they can and cannot teach. These are the things where we, is this the, you know, that is certainly a area fraught with concern and battles in the courts all the time. So I think ultimately it's telling a JPA you can't make any decisions between now and July 25. And that's- No, 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 no. Nobody's saying that they can't make decisions. We want them to have all of their <coughs> current rights and abilities. But what we don't want is for them to be able to obligate everybody else once they lose authority and to that end um to that end my question is what is there in the law what is there in your operating procedures that says that specific language cannot be added to that yeah i mean i think the reality is any decision the marsh jpa makes is going to have implications past july so to say what you're really asking for, even though you're saying you don't want to prohibit them from making decisions, the reality is any decision they make today is going to obligate somebody to something after July 1st of 2025. But so the, the notion about the obligations, the contractual obligations should not continue past the transfer date. They and can make the, any decision they want. Yeah, but then we have, that goes back to not having closed discussion. Then whatever decision they make between now and July, June 30th, we all have to go back and renegotiate those contracts. No, no, I think, no. I'm saying your, yeah, bill, no, I hear what you're saying. your bill basically says that we accept everything that they give us. Well, I, I think but, we can try to come up with language that says any decision they make after a certain date up to that can be at the behest of the county, go back and revisit those because those were done at the last minute. It doesn't mean they can't do them. It means that the county would have the ability to challenge those that are done after a certain date when the bill is signed or whatever it work. is, they can still make those decisions, but the county would be able to go back and and change them or alter them or whatever it needs. And I would, so, I would encourage, I would encourage everybody, um, you've got both on my email address, um, a suggestion like the 658.65.3 is something that we can review and consider any other proposed language, please feel free to send it and we'll review it and take a look at yeah, it as well. We'll put that together. Section B1, B2, and C. There's three different sets of time frames in which rules take precedence. One is on land use laws, which says that they will remain in effect. One is on land use entitlements, and those shall be enforceable by the county and they shall remain in effect. And then there's regulatory ordinances or resolutions, which if there's conflict, then the county gets in charge, maybe depending on where they can be changed by the county. So I mean, can you explain why those specific why that language chosen? Yeah, because sometimes there's a requirement to update ordinances. And so the idea is that these ordinances would be uh, as adopted by the March JPA until they are, uh, unless and until they are reviewed by the county for some reason. Um, specifically, is there a change in state law? Is there a change in uh, environmental rules or laws that we would have to update our ordinances? When I asked about the 640 ordinances and the 80 resolutions, has the county gone through all of those and see and done uh, a research of what they are to see what the financial impact is that they're actually taking on to say whether, like, say that this SD994 is the right course of action because of the research that's been done and can be provided to the public that says, okay, Riverside County is going to take on, let's just say, for just hypothetical reasons. Four trillion dollars in money that needs to be um, allocated somewhere, but and now all of a sudden we have a, a huge deficit. But we're still going to want to accept this because we don't want anything new. But at the same time, what's the analysis that's been done on those things to say that this is a good financial decision for Riverside County to accept that? It's not so much the ordinances and the rules that are the where the financial analysis has to come. Okay. It's, it's the settlement agreements, right? And I think a good example is the parks. So we are absolutely looking at um, 
what the cost would be to enforce those agreements if and when they come to the county. And we're looking at what uh, money and from where should come with that to uh, effectuate those agreements. So we are absolutely in the process of doing those things. And I will tell you, um, one of the issues in Sacramento will be if there is the perception that the county would need funding from the state to effectuate this, that would go yet to another committee and would probably make the bill dead on arrival. So that is something that, well, I mean, it's just a, a matter of fact, right? This is not a good time for Sacramento to be passing laws that cost money. Um, that never stops. in the hole. Yeah, it depends who you ask, right? But it's certainly, <laughs> if you saw my presentation yesterday, it is something that causes concerns to us, right? Um, there's a phrase that Sacramento catches the sniffle, we get the cold, right? So, um, but to answer your question briefly, yes, we're looking at what the implications of those things are. And based on what you have so far, is it in your best judgment or assessment that accepting SB 994 is, is the right way to go financially? So there's a phrase and the folks from the county will flinch when I say this. Um, the analysis sometimes we have to use is the juice worth the squeeze. Right. Um, there is a very significant benefit to having finality of the decisions that are being made. There's a very significant benefit of not reopening all of these settled decisions. And so we believe that that is, for, back to the juice worth the squeeze, a significant amount of juice. We're looking at what are the costs of some of these things and, you know, working with the JPA and making comments that funding should come with the obligation. Are there meetings that you're having about this matter that public can attend, or is it all internal? Well, certainly, uh, the March JPA, there was a meeting. Um, I know at least one person here, if not two people here, attended, and we made a presentation on this uh, to the March JPA. Um, most of the discussions have been uh, internal discussions. I don't think that we've had yet um, another public meeting. But this is, again, we wanted to make sure that we were hearing, to, and this is why it was important for me to come. I wanted to hear what the criticism was because I'm sitting there um, thinking, gosh, 994 doesn't do these things that people are afraid that it's doing. So I just, it was important for me to hear the issue is not with the bill. The issue is really stems from a, and it stems from a lack of trust with the Marsh JPA. And so that's where, again, it helps us try and shape if there is an amendment to the bill that we can suggest, but the problem we're trying to solve is. Uh, who's in here wrong with amending the bills? You don't trust the RSG. And just put a moratorium on that activity. Because we do not trust the RSG. It's not as though Sacramento's never told some small group what to do. Like, there's lots of things I'd like to put in the bills. Let's do it. Yeah. Smarter folks than me convince me not to do those things. If you want to continue to do Well, but we can work on some things. And you've got my email address? Yeah, I think we've got some. When the JPA votes, is what eight voting members, four from the each of the cities and two from the county. Yep. And so, is it all just five votes wins? I don't know if it's a majority or a supermajority or majority. So, Paris and Mobile can screw rivers out all they want. Yes. And say, kind of like I said, as long as somebody on the other side to get one vote. Yeah, you know, but I will say that. Um, back to the original purpose of creating the JPA is to take a truly regional approach. And um, whatever folks you are, the current members of the JPA or past members of the JPA, it really is an effort to think regionally and not have one city act in the detriment of another city on the JPA. Just one more question. Oh, come on. Previous one. So, I would imagine with internal discussions, there's minutes being taken, and then having the public, you know, be having visibility on that, that could prolong the process and blow the schedule out. But um, not to argue against my recommendation, but just face reality. But you know, is there some way to so that so that rather than have another meeting for us to get an update, but if people wanted to sign up, that they could get some kind of a document that says. You know, you start getting a running log issue by issue so that you can see, okay, this has now been resolved. And so you can say, well, if, if you think there needs to be a meeting about it, we can consider that so it can become interactive. At least that way people can pulse it. Maybe that gives you more current feedback. 
So what I can do is provide updates to uh, the group via the, the email from YouTube um, and provide updates uh, if one of them. And any analysis or stuff that's done on those settlement agreements that would be worthy for us to know about. If I can commit to giving out this to the group, sir. Um, I'd just like to note that the county, the city, and the JP have met on the park twice. We had asked to be included on any notifications. They excluded us. We asked for the minutes. They said they took none. They gave us no meeting summary. And so that sort of lack of transparency is part of the reason we have such an issue with crossing the JPA and also the county that's because they are not including us in the conversation about a park, which is supposed to be our park. So we'd like to understand why we are being deliberately excluded from conversations and why there are no records being had that the community can examine. If you want to start building trust, that has to be trustworthy actions from the county and the city, as well as the JPA. The process is actually about four. Thanks for that feedback. And that happened in December and January, last two months, about this. Because we asked for notification on all these things. So it's it's really an issue, and the county and the city are problematic about not including this. All right. Well, let's thank Jeff. I think um, I enjoyed having him come up. That's inspirational. It's given us a lot to think about. We really appreciate it and explained it. Um, I read the thing, I don't know how many times you couldn't figure out what it was saying. Uh, <laughs> Intel bills are deliberately written. <laughs> well, I looked at a lot of laws, resolutions, normatives, guidelines, everything. But this one was a bit confusing. But we appreciate it. We'll get back right. to you certainly with our uh, recommendations and back to the senator's office. And we appreciate, appreciate you for coming and all of you for coming. Uh, joining on me. So we'll take like a five minute break and then we'll reconvene.